Good morning. Welcome to Independent Methodist Church. Today is Sunday, the 18th of October, 2020. I would like to invite you to be pers in person on Friday, October 30th at 6 p.m. This pre-recorded service will have a live congregation. And if you are available to be here, there will also be our Saturday and Sunday service. But again, the invitation, one-time event, 6 p.m., Friday, the 30th of October, for our All Saints weekend. And there will be guest musicians, floral artistry, and a commemorative candle lighting of family and friends of the congregation who have gone to be with the Lord since last November 1st. The children are reminded that on the weekend of the 23rd and 24th, the Social Life Committee will distribute children's uh, bags of treats. A letter will go out to the congregation on Monday. Also, remember, in two weeks, Halloween night, the 31st of October, you turn your clock a back one hour, spring forward, fall behind. There will be an annual outdoor cleanup of the parking lot and the outside of the church on the 24th, Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Your help would be greatly appreciated. It is good that you are with us. Have a nice week.
Good morning. I'm certain that you're getting excited about Halloween, your costume, going out trick-or-treating, maybe having a party, carving a jack-o'-lantern, a lot of activity this time of the year. And of course, if you haven't already, I'm certain that you will watch on TV. It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And that came out in the year 1966, and it was put together by a cartoonist by the name of Charles Schultz. And Charles Schultz was a Methodist Sunday school teacher. He was also a licensed minister in the Methodist church. And he used his cartoons, he used his comic strip uh, to bring in messages uh, about faith in God and Jesus in the Bible. And we're gonna look at a few lessons that we can receive from watching it's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Well, the first one that I want to share with you, Lucy and Lioness, sister and brother. Now, Lioness is doing what? He's writing a letter to the Great Pumpkin. Now, he's probably the only person in the entire world writing a letter to the Great Pumpkin. He got this idea that the Great Pumpkin brings lots of candy and toys to children at Halloween. Nobody else thinks that way, but he does. And his sister has had enough of it. And as you see here, she put her fist up. She wants to fight. And she says, cut it out. I don't want to hear about that great pumpkin. And what does Lioness say? I have learned there are three things in life you don't talk about. Politics, religion, and the great pumpkin. And with a national election and so much division in our country, maybe one thing that we should maybe not talk about is the election. Because we're going to get people mad and get people upset. All right, so show, show some caution here, right? That's, that's a lesson. There's maybe some subjects that we don't talk about with some people. Now, maybe another subject, maybe a person is overweight. And if we poke fun of them and, and bring up, are you aware you're putting on a lot of weight? Or if you look at another person who's very thin and you call that, you're skinny. What's, aren't you eating? When we start talking about other people and their issues in life, we can hurt their feelings and make people angry and sometimes have conflict. All right, and that's maybe not what we should be doing. All right, we need to show wisdom here. Uh, all right, so that is a lesson that we learned from It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. Another thing that we learned from The Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, the Peanuts gang went out trick-or-treating from door to door. And, uh, and after they would go to a house, they would look in their bag, what did they get? And they got candy, oh, lots of candy. They were happy. But then Charlie Brown, he would look in his bag and what did he get? A rock. That's all he got. House after house, he got rocks. Now, what, what is this about? Why, why is that in the story? It's a reminder to us we can be disappointed. There are disappointments in life. Charlie Brown went to a house thinking he was going to get a candy bar. He got a, he got a rock. But everybody else got candy, but he didn't. Please understand that life is unfair, and unfairness in life brings disappointment. Everybody cannot be an A student. Everybody cannot be number one. Everybody cannot be the winner of a game. That's, that's how life is. When I was a boy, my brothers would have friends who would invite them to the birthday party, but I didn't get invited. I had to stay home. That's how life goes, right? So it's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, with Charlie Brown receiving rocks in his trick-or-treat bag, a reminder to us there's going to be disappointments. So don't be upset with your disappointment. And one more lesson in this great book and the video Lioness and Lucy, she really did care about her brother. When she would go trick-or-treating, 
she would say to the people, my brother's not going trick-or-treating. Can you give me an extra piece of candy for him? So she did, she did care about him. Now, Charlie Brown stayed all night long in the pumpkin patch waiting for the great pumpkin. It was cold and it was, it was dark, all right, but she came late at night and she picked him up and she carried him home and helped put him to bed. She did love her brother, even though at times they, they get into arguments. And I can tell you, if there's anything more that your father and mother want, the number one thing that your parents want from you is to try to get along with your brother and sister. There's too much conflict in homes, too much fighting. That's, that's not what God wants. And if we want to do what God wants us to do, we will try to eliminate conflict and try to love your brother and sister. And if they do things and say things that maybe aren't right, if it's not too bad, maybe just overlook it, okay? Let it go. And if they, of course, do something very bad, then it needs to be reported to, to the parent. But these are all lessons that we learn in the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, given to us by Charles Schultz, a minister. And what I'm going to give you for your gift this weekend is a package of, it's the great pumpkin cutouts that you can use in your home to decorate for the holiday. I hope you have a good week and we will see you next Sunday. The Word of God is found in the second book of Kings, chapter 4, verses 38 through 44, and chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I am reading for the New International Version Bible, Three Miracles by the Prophet Elisha, the Pot of Gourd Stew, the Feeding of the One Hundred, and the Floating Axe Head. Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in that region. While the company of the prophets was meeting with him, he said to his servant, Put on a large pot and cook some stew for these men. One of them went out into the fields and gathered herbs and found a wild vine. He gathered some of its cords and filled it in his fold with his cloak. When he returned, he cut them up into the pot of stew, though no one knew what they were. The stew was poured out for the men, but as they began to eat it, they cried out, O oh, man of God, there is death in this pot, and they could not eat it. Elisha said, Get some flour. He put it into the pot and said, Serve it to the people to eat, and there was nothing harmful in the pot. A man came from Baal Shalashah, Bring the man of God twenty loaves of barley bread, baked in the first ripe grain, along with some beads of new grain. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men, his servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. Thy will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. The company of prophets said to Elijah, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, where each of us can get a pole, and let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elijah replied. And he went with them. Then he went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. Then the man God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out with his hand and took it. This is the word of the Lord. Too many clergy utter prayer without possessing belief in its power, preach sermons with no passion, and they go through the motions of ceremonies in the church. And today things are compounded by the pandemic and its negative impact on congregations. With pastors now overcome by doubt, discouragement, and defeat. 
Elisha's work among his students is a call for us to put the miraculous back into our ministries. George Beverly Shea, the soloist at the Billy Graham Crusades, sang a gospel song, There's a wonder of sunset at evening, the wonder as sunrise I see, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. We need a shot in the arm to know that God loves us to continue in our ministries. And the majority of Elisha's demonstrations of miraculous power were acted before his followers and their families, preserving them from physical want, financial distress, or death. Future generations of leaders must experientially know that the Lord God displays his compassionate care by ruling over his own laws of nature. Why are these oddities part of divine revelation? Fourteen miracles are recorded in 2 Kings performed by Elisha. The poisoned pot of stew, the multiplication of the loaves, and the floating axe head are among the lesser known. Elisha is the headmaster of three seminaries in Jericho, Bethel, and Gilgal. He travels back and forth between the campuses. As the spiritual overseer of a large number of students, Elisha's on-the-job training program with these supernatural wonders is intended to teach lessons that these men have exhausted human limitation must turn to the Lord for relief, remedy, and reflection. Miracles were never meant to convert the unbelieving crowd, but to enable the already saved people of God to remain faithful unto the Lord. Miracles in the Bible not only authenticate the messenger and his message, but they are valuable lessons provided for all future teachers. Because Israel had become apostate and rejected the one true Lord, he unleashed his wrath on the land with a drought and famine. When a nation turns away from the Lord, as we have, he brings judgment. And the people of God are not exempt from undergoing the hardship imposed on a country. During this drought and famine, Elisha is showcased as a good shepherd. He did not abandon his post in tough times. During the drought and famine, pupils at the theological schools gathered their meager supply of vegetables to cook a pot of soup. The class was dispatched to go out on a nature walk and combed the countryside in pursuit of herbs. And these herbs were to put some pizzazz in this culinary concoction. Here is an example of a maxim, too many chefs spoil the broth. All were sent on a scavenger hunt in the woods to find edible plants to season the soup. There was a ministerial student majoring in theology, not botany, and he discovered some gourds in the outback. He looked upon them as wild melons. He picked them and he carried them in his cloak. Upon arrival at the campfire, he cut up these melons and tossed them into the simmering mixture as his contribution. Believe it when I say this guy was no chef Emeril Lagasse or Mario Patelli. He was unaware of the toxic nature of his ingredients. The entire student body looked forward to this grub. 
No plan B existed for supper. The trainees immediately detected that the bitter taste of this goulash was unfit for consumption. The narrative does not report anyone suffered stomach pain or nausea. Now what? The malnourished theological students looking forward to this child knew that it was out of the question of dumping the entire cauldron down the garbage disposal. Elisha, the miracle worker, stepped in to save the day. The previous food tasters were instructed to pour their bowls back into the boiling crock. Waste not, want not. The man of God dropped in some flour into the kettle and instantly made the stew good again. A prophet purified a poisonous pot of porridge. How is that for alliteration? Some commentators take the perspective that the addition of the flour neutralized the poison, absorbing the toxic elements. The flour did not bring about a decontamination of the stew. It was the unseen hand of God working through Elisha. This episode parallels Elisha's earlier removal of the contamination of the undrinkable water in Jericho by the sprinkling of salt. Scene two, an unidentified farmer attempting to be faithful to the law of Moses brought the first fruits of his grain harvest to Elisha. When the first apple is ripened on a tree, the first cluster of grapes on a vine, and the first grain in a field, these are the first fruits. And stipulated in Old Testament legislation, they are to be set aside as a thank offering unto the Lord. The farmer did not scrape the bottom of the barrel and see what he had left over to render unto the Lord. He gave the very first of the newly ripened and presented it unto the servant of the Lord of the harvest. Baking 20 barley loaves of bread, the size of a hamburger bun, the farmer also donated heads of grain, which may have been roasted and enjoyed like a snack or to be fried in a skillet of olive oil. Recall the backdrop of this story, a drought, and there is a rationing of food. Elisha proposed that the entire school census, numbering 100, be invited to lunch and serve this basket of baked goods. Gehazi, Elisha's right-hand man, balked at the suggestion that the barley bread was adequate to feed this gathering of guys with a he-man appetite. Elisha knew how to miraculously stretch a meal with all eating their fill plus leftovers guaranteed. Scene three, the school saw a dramatic increase in its enrollment, necessitating an enlargement of the facility. The students were recruited to cut the trees and to saw the lumber for the construction of a new structure. An unidentified fellow, lacking tools, wanting to pitch in and help, borrowed an axe from a lumberjack. When swinging the axe, the head flew off and sunk in the nearby Jordan River. The man is out of his mind in worry, lacking the money to replace the blade. What's the big deal? Just go to Lowe's or Home Depot and pick up an ax. They come in a variety of sizes, hatchet, tomahawk, firefighter, splitting rail, and carpenter, ranging in price from $20 to $100. Today, axes are mass-produced 
on an assembly line. 2,900 years ago, they were crafted one at a time at a foundry. Like me, in high school social studies or physical science class, we were taught first came the Stone Age, followed by the Bronze Age, and next the Iron Age. This is the Iron Age, and any kind of iron tool was pricey. Iron made for a superior weapon and tool, and it outdated the previous stone and bronze tools. The situation confronting this student would be like a friend loaning her car, you wrecking the vehicle without insurance coverage, and with no monetary means to purchase a new auto. The axe head is in deep water and the student is in deep trouble. The student did not have two nickels to rub together. What is he going to do? This man may have to drop out of school to get a job to finance a new axe. Without a tool, the construction site is now minus one worker. The chap showed Elisha where the axe head landed beneath the water. The Jordan is not a clear river, but a muddy stream. Elisha did not fish out the axe with a pole. Instead, he made a new handle. He threw it into the water with the blade rising to the surface, attaching itself to the piece of wood. To the stunned amazement of all by the riverbank, the axe head floated like a bar of ivory soap. What are the lessons here that Elisha is teaching his students and valuable for all people of God? Charity is a key element in the Christian life. We all know the golden rule, love thy neighbor as thyself, but lesser known is Jesus's silver rule. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Acts 20, 35. It was a meager harvest that year, and the adverse weather prohibited the farmer from supplying Elisha with an abundant offering. But he gave in proportion to what the Lord had given to him. And the more we get from God, the more we are enabled to share with others. And during this time of fiscal hardship and confusion, do not allow ourselves to be holding back from the Lord. The Lord wants us to give as he gives unto us. Second, Elisha promoted team effort with an intention of fostering a sense of family unity. The students were challenged to cook soup, supply a cornucopia of vegetables, hunt for herbs, eat from the same cooking pot, and pitch in and assist with the carpentry of the new building. These efforts fostered a belonging. Sitting in a classroom, reading the biblical scrolls and listening to a lecture would not fuse a unity of purpose. If we feel that we are on, are on the outside looking in at a church or a club or group or organization, is it because we are a pew sitter and we are reluctant to get involved? Once upon a time, there were four men everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was asked to do it, but everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about it because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, and nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. 
it ended up that everybody blamed somebody and nobody did the job that anybody could have done in the first place. Be assured, the students would stay clear of the board plant. The man who dumped the poisonous wards into the kettle acted out of ignorance or innocence. He mistook them for an edible cucumber or squash. Also, the axe head flew off its handle was due to faulty workmanship, worn out by much use, or the result of carelessness by the man chopping away. And in the future, the student may have hesitated to borrow a tool, reveal greater caution with its use, and certainly stay clear of the river. These young preacher men are being instructed, there are valuable life lessons to be acquired. You made a mistake. It could have been a fatal mistake. Fortunately, no one got sick or killed. Learn from this happening and move on in life. We all make mistakes, but are we learning from them? A new teller at the bank was introduced to the president. Sir, one day I might go up to the top of the ladder like yourself and be a chief executive. Do you have any advice for me? Yes, young man, just two words, right decisions. But how do I learn to make right decisions? By experience. And how do I get experience? By making bad decisions. A young businessman was placed in charge of a factory. After a year of operation under his management, the company lost $10 million. Expected to be fired, the supervisor was called to meet with the board. I suppose you want my resignation. The chairman answered, no, we do not want your resignation. We want to keep you because we believe we have made an investment in you. Your education cost the corporation $10 million. Sir Winston Churchill urged, all men make mistakes, but only wise men learn from their mistakes. Rotten soup, barley bread, and a retrieved hatchet. No need is too trivial to bring before our Heavenly Father. He cares about our small and mundane incidents which take on paramount importance for us. The Apostle Peter wrote, Cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. And St. Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 6, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. We make petitions for the salvation of our lost family and friends. We cry out forgiveness when we sin big time. And we desire an assurance of an eternal home in heaven but suspect that the Heavenly Father doesn't want to hear about all the small stuff in our life. The Lord God is concerned about what is of concern to us. The sick pet, the missing cell phone, and the broken relationship. Jesus taught that the Father knows the numbers of hair on our heads, for him to have an accurate count on me, he must continually be updating his data bank every day as I wash and comb my hair. The master and the prophet Elisha underscored that Christ cares about what we care about, the practical day-to-day -day side of life. 
Not only does he care, Father God stands available to give resolution to these issues. John Newton is best remembered for writing the lyrics of Amazing Grace. Actually, he was a prolific author of religious poetry. And in one of them, he makes reference to the axe head of Elisha. Not one concern of ours is small if we belong to him. To teach us this, the Lord of all once made the axe head to swim. For decades, Ann Landers had a nationally syndicated newspaper advice column for the readership to submit questions for her counsel. From 1988, she received this inquiry. Dear Ann Landers, my father raised me with some very sound ideas. One notion had to do with borrowing. He said, if you borrow anything, something once is the limit. If you need it again, go out and buy your own. My problem is three neighbors. They are car nuts. Every year they buy new cars. On weekends they wash, polish, and vacuum. Since they are so in love with their cars, wouldn't you think that they would have their own vacuum? Well, they don't. They are wearing mine out. Last weekend, I had had it. I told one of the three guys, look, you're making $15 an hour. That's more than I make. Why don't you buy your own vacuum? The guy didn't take offense, but my wife did. She called me ungracious and said that if I carried on like that, we wouldn't have a friend left in town. The same guy borrowed our lawnmower last year and broke it. The other guy borrowed our limb lopper and lost it. The third bozo borrowed our electric hospital bed and returned it two years later in terrible condition. My wife is on my case and I need some help. Am I wrong? Sign, Mesa, Arizona. Dear Mesa, you're not wrong. Your wife is. Letting people take advantage of you is no way to cement friendship. It's fine to help a neighbor in a tight spot, but lending him a tool or a piece of equipment, but then they borrow habitually instead of buying their own, it's time to lower the boom, signed Anne. Believe it or not, there are many principles in the Bible about making a loan to an individual, whether a personal item or money. Exodus 22:14. If anyone borrows an animal from their neighbor and it is injured or dies while the owner is not present, they must make restitution. Psalm 37, verse 21. The wicked borrow and do not repay. When a Christian is loaned an article for use, we are held responsible for the item, and if lost or damaged, we are to make good with compensation. And this is a subplot in this story. Eating the poison soup, Elisha could have been called in to officiate at a funeral. When the axe head flew off the handle, it could have struck one of the labor gang and either injured him or killed him. Thank God it didn't happen. The devotional author, Matthew Henry, was once held up on the street by a robber running off with his wallet. From this encounter, the great man of God shared that he found four reasons to be thankful. Number one, it was the first time experience. He had never been robbed before. Number two, the thief took his wallet not his life. Number three, 
The robber took all the money he had on him, but it wasn't very much. And four, he was the one robbed, not the one doing the robbing. Matthew Henry knew how to make lemonade when handed a lemon. As a victim of crime, his situation could have been worse. And the Lord God, in his providential care, overruled the potential for death in these circumstances. And Christ, by the person of the Holy Spirit, or the presence of a guardian angel, has kept us safe from danger, seen and unseen. And we may be unaware of them and will not know of a close call with the grim reaper until we get to heaven. We are reminded of this as we read about the poison stew and the axe head. I once knew a former Catholic nun who left the order. She shared that during her first year of training, known as the postulancy, she was forbidden to write, telephone, or converse with her parents. But they were permitted on Fridays to attend the chapel services at the mother house, confined to the balcony, seeing their daughter from afar. Her mom and dad devised a secret signal to let the nun in training know that they had stopped by the convent. Each visit, they donated a crate of pineapple, her favorite fruit for all the sisters to enjoy. The sisters, as part of their vow of poverty, did not buy groceries. They ate whatever food came into the community. And the purpose of this discipline was to develop contentment. The nunnery was not running a restaurant. The dining hall had two items on the menu, take it or leave it. And when the nuns had the delicacy of fresh pineapple, not over, not only were they overcome by much joy, but the daughter knew that her parents had come through the door. Feast or famine. Imagine living your life like that, with a global economic collapse that may impact all of us. Our faith in God may be tested. Second Kings chapter 4 showcases stew and bread as an assurance of God coming through with ample provision. Two food stories, stew and bread. Elisha had to emphasize to these pros prospective preachers charged with the spiritual care of Israel in a spectacular way, the God who is Jehovah Jireh will supply for our need. And the guarantee is never that we will be able to have noodles Romanoff and chicken Kiev and Welsh rabbit. Learn to be satisfied with once poisoned stew and you might prefer Tuscany bread and Vienna bread and Irish soda bread, but can we acquire a taste for a morsel of barley bread? We will not go hungry. Basic needs are assured if we are able to live one day at a time. And the multiplication by Elisha anticipates the work of our blessed Lord. The loaves and fishes is the only miracle of Christ recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The wonder workers of the Old Testament, like Elisha, are eclipsed by the Son of God. 
Note the similarities and the contrast between the multiplication of bread by Elisha and that of Jesus. Elisha, a crowd of 100 men, Jesus fed 5,000. The presence of a hungry crowd. Elisha took pity, Jesus had compassion. A few barley loaves were presented by a farmer. In John's Gospel, they are donated by a little boy. Elijah had 20 loaves, Jesus had five. In each case, an unbelieving attendant raised objections. Elisha fed the men through his servant Gehazi, Jesus fed the crowd through his 12 apostles. Jesus supplied a better meal deal, fish and bread. Elijah only a biscuit and heads of grain. After all had been eaten, there was a surplus. Jesus used his power, whereas Elisha relied upon the power of God. Please never discount the significance of the Old Testament that amplify the New Testament. The Prince of Preachers of the Christian Missionary Alliance, A.W. Tozer wrote, you can be perfectly free to go to your Bible with an assurance that you will find Jesus Christ on its every page. Elijah and Elisha are types. John the Baptist is the greater Elijah and Jesus Christ the greater Elisha. And this multiplication of the barley loaves is an anticipation of this spiritual truth. As Saint Augustine taught, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your prayer by the lectern. O God of all times and places, we pray for your church, which is set today amid the perplexities of a changing order and face to face with new tasks. Baptize her afresh in the life-giving spirit of Jesus, bestow upon her a great responsiveness to duty, a swifter compassion with suffering, and the utter loyalty to your will. Help her to proclaim boldly the coming of your kingdom. Put upon her lips the ancient gospel of the Lord. Fill her with the prophet's scorn of tyranny and with a Christ-like tenderness for the heavy laden and downtrodden. Bid her cease from seeking her own life, lest she lose it. Make her valiant to give up her life to humanity, that, like her crucified Lord, she may mount by the path of the cross to a higher glory, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now follow me with the unison prayer. O most loving and tender Father, preserve us from all faithless cares and selfish anxieties, and help us to cast our burdens upon you, who has given us assurance of your care for us, and has promised to supply the needs of all who seek first your kingdom, and for the sake of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. And now for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen.